वेलकम टू दिस मस्ट बी हार्ड अ रिकॉर्डिंग पॉडकास्ट फीचरिंग डिस्कशन ऑफ डेलावे काउंटी कम्युनिटी कॉलेज इवेंट्स अचीवमेंट्स एंड इनिशियटिव टूडे ओलिविया कोलाज एंड लुशॉन्डा स्टीवेंस टॉक विद आर गेस्ट डॉक्टर ओलिविया फ्लोरेक फ्रॉम द कम्युनिकेशन आर्ट्स एंड ह्यूमैनिटीज डिविजन द डिस्कस अबाउट द कंटेम्प्ररी आर्ट एग्जिबिशन एंड द स्टूडेंट्स असाइनमेंट टू राइट द लेबल्स विद द आर्ट वर्क वी ऑल्सो हैव रिफ्लेक्शन रिस्पॉन्सिस फ्रॉम सम ऑफ द अदर स्टूडेंट्स Thank you for listening. Hi, and welcome to This Must Be Heard. I am your host, Olivia Coulange, and I'm here today with my co-host, Lushanda Stevens, and our guest today, Dr. Florek. Thank you ladies for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm very excited for this conversation. Great. So, today we're going to be discussing the new art installation in the art gallery called Collection as Classroom. Let's dive right in. Our first question for you, Dr. Florek, is What does the collection as classroom mean to you and what is the back story behind the title? So I'm a professor of art history here at the college and part of my teaching responsibility is curating an exhibition of contemporary art every spring. Typically I work with a single artist and we bring in a lot of different objects at that, that one artist has made but I really wanted to do something that would have a wider variety of artworks because I thought that it would be more engaging for the students. The idea for The collection as classroom came from this renaissance practice in which artists would study older works of art and contemporary artworks in their teacher studios. And so this exhibit is giving our art students an opportunity to study a wide variety of objects right here on the college campus. So, um the works come from the private collections of our faculty, Professor Jamie Treadwell, Professor Matthew Seppielli, and Professor David Yox, and they represent every type of artistic medium. There's photography, painting, etchings, and sculptures, and none of the work is older than 30 years. And so it's really like exciting contemporary artists. I also wanted an opportunity to engage my art history students with the work. And so I have assigned students in my art of the modern world class where they had to write labels for the artworks. In the exhibit there are 28 artworks and 25 of them have labels written by our students, many of whom had never studied art history before. I like how you share that you bring in the students as well as reaching out to your professors or your colleagues to collect a collection of body work for the students. Now I would like to go back. You mentioned about contemporary artwork. What does that mean? A contemporary artwork is anything that was produced really in like the last 30 years or by a living artist. Um most of the artists in the exhibit are still alive although some of them have passed away. Um but really it means anything that is is produced by a living artist or a recently deceased artist. So, Dr. Flores, could you explain to us what the student research project is and the purpose behind it? So, my goal here was for students to understand the challenges and the rewards of introducing people to contemporary artwork. Um sometimes contemporary artwork can be intimidating, right? It's very abstract or very conceptual and you feel like you need to have this huge amount of background to write about it. But for my students, what I wanted to focus on is how they could understand these artworks just based on visual analysis. So the way that the assignment began was through uh students writing close descriptive essays about the appearance of the artworks they didn't worry about the subject matter they didn't worry about like what the artwork necessarily meant it was more about describing the shapes and the forms and the way the artist had organized the space based on their visual analysis the next step was to complete readings that were focused on these particular artists i developed a dossier of readings that the students accessed and spent time closely reading in order to understand the works and based firstly on their visual analysis they developed labels that incorporated additional information that they thought would be relevant for the viewer And so ultimately I wanted it to be student led that it was what they thought was important about these objects and how can they explain that to visitors to the exhibit. The other thing I really wanted the students to understand is that they were basically experts on these artworks. Because these are objects that are in private collections, very few people have seen them. And so the amount of time that these students have spent with the objects has given them an authority over their meanings. And so I wanted students to understand that if they think it means something, 
and they can support it with their visual analysis, then they're probably right. I just think it's really empowering to develop that type of authority over something, regardless of whether it's within your particular discipline or not. So the majority of my students in this class are pursuing a studio art major, but I have several liberal arts majors, a computer science major, and some general studies majors as well. And across all of these disciplines, every one of them were able to develop, honestly, very sophisticated interpretations of the works. I like that you really make sure that it is student driven, that they're actually participating and making this collection kind of come to life, you could say. Now, could I ask, do you believe that this will help them to develop their personal artwork as well? Absolutely. I think that for working artists, it's very important to engage with other artwork. Last week, we had a panel with Professor Seppielli and Professor Yox, where they talked about how they acquired the works in the collection. And the majority of them were through personal relationships that they had with the artists. Maybe they were in school together, or maybe it was one of their faculty members. Um, these were works that when the collectors look at them, they remember the artists themselves who made it. And wow. I think that for our students who are, are pursuing fine arts degrees, it's a way of thinking about the community they've built here at Delaware County Community College, the work that they've produced together in the studio, and ways that their peers are shaping their current production and how, like, in the future, they might want to remember and, and hold on to some of the artworks that they've produced during this time. That is really beautiful to know, and that is good for the students to really express and cherish with them along their journey. Personally, I'm curious to know, I know that while you students were creating the labels for the artwork, you guys viewed reproductions of them. So could you describe from yours or your students' point of view how it felt to view the artwork in person? I'd love to. So this is probably my favorite thing, because most of the time I'm always working with artwork in reproduction, right? I project it on the screen through my PowerPoint. The color is never exactly right. The size is always, you know, you need to kind of imagine what it would be. And that's how this started. They looked at high quality photographs of the artworks and they based their visual analysis on that. But then when we went into the gallery, people were just like, oh, I didn't realize it was going to be that big or the color is totally different in person than it is within that reproduction. Or one student was looking at this etching by Carolina Franco Garcia, and we realized that at the bottom of the etching, the artist had actually glued additional paper onto its surface. And you couldn't see that in the reproduction, right? Like the reproduction just flattens everything. But then when you're in person, you can see that like there's a ridge and there's it, it's a little higher up. And we realized that the bottom part, these dog feet that are at the bottom of this long etching are actually like separate objects that the, the artist glued onto its surface. Um, oh, wow. And so it's almost like it was like a discovery, right? That we never would have been able to experience if we hadn't had it here in person. So it was just, I, I can't even tell you how much fun it was to look at the artwork with the students like this. I am very detail oriented, so I would love that experience. I should definitely go to the art museum more often. I would love to go see the exhibit with you and see what you think. Oh my gosh, I would love that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, for our last question of the day, what do you hope the students gain from this project? For my art history students, I want them to feel very comfortable walking into any museum that they encounter and looking at the artwork there. Most of them had no background in contemporary art when we began this, and in fact, within our course content, we haven't gotten anywhere close to contemporary art. We're still in the 18th century. And yet, without that background, they've still been able to develop really interesting and meaningful essays about these artworks. And so I feel like they can go into a museum, any museum, and, and do this, no matter what they're looking at, because of those skills that they developed. But also proud. Like, honestly, I'm so proud of them. It's like, I, I can't believe how well, I can't believe, I, I can't believe how well they've done. When I was telling a colleague about it, someone who doesn't work at our college, she was mm -hmm. like, Olivia, that's a really hard ask. And I was like, yeah, I guess it is. But I know, <laughs> I, I know they can do it. Mm -hmm. and, and they have, they've, they've done fantastic work. That's beautiful to see you have your, that much confidence in your students and it's deserved. They deserve that. Mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Florek, do you have any final thoughts? I'd really like to encourage uh, your listeners to visit the gallery. The exhibit is open now through April 12th, 2024. Um, it is open Monday through Friday from 10 
a.m. to 5 p.m. and it's completely free and open to the public and so I'd really encourage anyone listening to come and look at the work. A little bit of time, spend a long time, come back multiple times. I'd love for everybody on our campus, on the Marple campus, to get to enjoy these works. Amazing. Well, that looks like all the time that we have today. I'd like to thank my co-host, Rashonda Stevens, for joining me, and a huge thank you to Dr. Florek for joining us and sharing her insights and expertise. Thank you for inviting me. It's been really fun to talk about the exhibit with you, and I'm just thrilled that the new Media Lab was interested in learning about it. Likewise, please be sure to like and subscribe, and thank you for listening. And we're out. You have been listening to This Must Be Heard, brought to you by the New Media Lab. Here are three students who shared their visual analysis of the artwork that was presented to them. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Enoch. I'm a computer science major, and I'm in Art of the Modern World uh, with Dr. Florek. For our exhibit called Collection as a Classroom, which is in the art gallery on the second floor, I was tasked with writing a label for two different pieces. One being an untitled acrylic on canvas by Cleveland artist Scott Miller and an untitled artist proof of an aquatint by Hitoshi Nakazato, a uh, former University of Pennsylvania faculty member. Um, when I started this project, I had never really done visual analysis of art with like an end goal. Um, I'd been to a few different art museums and foundations, so I had an idea of how to look at art, but not how to put what I was seeing into words. And uh, I learned a lot about doing just that uh, when we were creating these labels. Being able to spend time with these two objects is really fun and enlightening. So, you know, at one point there was our first time seeing them in person. The thing that struck me the most was how large the painting by Scott Miller is. Where it is on that wall in the gallery, it just pulls your attention there. You walk in, you get to that side of the room, you just want to go to that Miller. It's awesome. Hi, I'm Kubera and I wrote about the Terry Atkins piece and also the George Dugan landscape one. When I first got to see them in person, uh, I was really surprised by the size. It was the first thing that really I noticed. The Dugan was a lot smaller than I thought and looking at it up close, I, I didn't realize that a lot of the work is done by your eyes and how it fills in a lot of these spaces where the paint is not fully completed, like the shape of the houses wasn't really made out to be a house, your eyes from a distance just fill that in. The Terry Atkins was a lot taller than I thought. I thought it was going to be a normal proportional size. I thought it was going to be about the size of the Dugan, but it was a lot bigger. And when we were writing the label for the pieces, the Dugan was much easier to write about because he was a more academically trained scholar. So I did not have that much of a struggle writing about his piece, but the Terry Atkins I thought that this piece is very personal to every person who looks at it, that I wouldn't know how to exactly put into words what it stood for, or how do I explain this to the person reading it. Um, but I'm happy with what I turned in. I'm happy I got to see them in person as well after all this time. When I first viewed my assigned objects, I was intimidated. But after completing my stylistic analyses, I felt like I knew them inside and out, and I ended up appreciating them more than I had anticipated. I felt a satisfying sense of discovery while studying the objects. I love learning about art, but I had never come up with my very own ideas in this way. It was a lot of fun. Viewing the works in person was a rewarding experience and helpful in completing my labels. I struggled to fit everything I had to say into 100 words. Seeing them with my own two eyes helped to finalize those decisions. Personally, I like experiencing art in person. Stylistic elements such as size and color don't strike me nearly as hard through a screen or in a book as they do in person. I saw details I hadn't noticed initially. You have been listening to This Must Be Hard, brought to you by the New Media Lab and the Office of Athletics and Campus Engagement. Today's hosts and producers were Olivia Collage and Lashonda Stevens. Our guests today were Dr. Olivia Florek, Ryan Enoch, Kubair Sharma, and Sarah McLaughlin. Our co-executive producers were Lashonda Stevens and Raymond Porus. Lashonda Stevens edited this episode and Saab John Osjohn prepared our title cards. Victoria Kilbreth and Samuel Larson designed our cover art. Indigo Fraser composed our theme music and I am Yagna Rangavajra, your announcer for this episode. 
Special thanks to the Director of Athletics and Campus Engagement, Alison Gleason, and our Faculty Advisor, Professor Maria Boyd. If you have an interest in participating in the New Media Lab, contact the Office of Athletics and Campus Engagement or reach out to us on Instagram at bccc underscore new media lab. Be sure to like and subscribe to us on YouTube. Thanks again for listening.